I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's Israeli Independence Day special, we hope you're ready because today we're celebrating Israel's 70th birthday. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. Israeli Independence Day has officially begun, so I hit the streets to see what Israelis had to say. And let us just say, the answers weren't exactly what I expected. Happy birthday, Israel. It's Israel's 70th birthday, and we want to know what Israelis think was the country's biggest accomplishment. Let's check it out. Well, be, be, being able to protect ourselves, so money, a lot of money. This conky, like, uh, ways. 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 Cherry tomatoes. So a kevet. Me, Bechan, le Kibur Haifa. No, no. זה הדבר הכי גדול שיש לך, אז אתה יודע, מה עם הסים קארד, מה עם ה-USB, מה עם ווייז? עומר אדם. 3, 2, 1, ו... כמו איזה שני משוגעים, איפה? בחוף! לקלוט מיליון וחצי עולים. שמענו רגעים יפים, ראינו את הנוף. אקזיסטנט? We survived against all odds. Staying alive. Apparently, existing is Israel's biggest accomplishment this year around, but we want to know what Israelis hope for the future. A better 70 years? I'm I wish us all, you know, a peace. Peace. Thing is peace. Shalom. All right, it's that time of year again. Twelve of Israel's top innovators, entertainers, and war heroes will be illuminating Israel by lighting the Independence Day torch this evening. So let's take a look at some of those that have been selected to take part in this special event. Paralympic gold medalist Noam Gilshoni will have a torch in hand. He was injured during a, heli a helicopter crash during the Second Lebanon War, and even though he's been confined to a wheelchair ever since, he's made a name for himself, winning a gold in the 2012 London Summer Paralympics for quad singles, and expressing the legacy of disabled and injured veterans. Singer and songwriter Shlomo Altsi is going to be lighting a torch, and he is who we like to call the Bob Dylan of Israel. Altsi has been performing since 1969 and producing some of the most well-known hits in Israel of all time. 89-year-old veteran actress Lea Koenig will also be lighting a torch. She has been performing in Israel and all over the world since the 1940s and has become the symbol of Israel's Habima National Theater, with, obviously, her iconic performances. 15-year-old schoolgirl Mae Corman might be young, but she's certainly having an impact. She'll be lighting a torch for patenting an idea to prevent children from being forgotten in cars. The spiritual leader of the Druze village, Sheikh Mawaf, Mawafak Tarif, will also be lighting a torch for helping promote interfaith dialogue in Israel. His family has been leading the local Druze community since 1753 and working tirelessly with the Jewish state to build a bridge of tolerance. Now, obviously, these are just five of the unique individuals that will have torches in hand, and there are many more to celebrate, but that's why you should watch the ceremony tonight yourself. And here's an interesting fact to note. Even though the ceremony is historically non-political, this year Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu will be lighting a torch with a brief speech himself. All right, we now bring you an exclusive interview with one of Israel's most important and influential leaders, Minister Naftali Bennett. A man of many hats, Bennett serves as Israel's Minister of Education as well as its Minister of Diaspora Affairs. And on top of that, he's also the leader of the Jewish Home Party, one of the most critical members of the current coalition. ILTV's Brett Allen Smith brings us this exclusive one-on-one. -on -one. I can only imagine how busy you are today. Thank you so much. I can't believe you're not out partying right now <laughs> and you're here with us doing this interview. Um, it's great to Bennett, be here. So you're the head of Diaspora Affairs, you're the education minister. Obviously, it's pretty safe to say that you have a very central role in shaping the country. So my question is, 
Today is Israel's 70th birthday, and Israel is a country that has come very far and achieved a lot in a relatively short amount of time. So how did Israel get here in such a short amount of time? Well, I think it's um, something in the Israeli ethos, um, which combines the ancient Jewish tradition of uh, thought, of uh, debate, um, and together with the uh, entrepreneurship uh, ethos of, of uh, Israel, of getting things done in the IDF. Um, when I was fairly young, uh, I think I was 22, I, I had already been commanding a, a company uh, as a captain uh, in the military. So Israelis at a relatively young age uh, get uh, extraordinary responsibilities, so it sort of expands your abilities and, and that's what takes Israel forward. Mm. Where do you think the country will be 70 years from now? Well, I think uh, Israel is on a very good path. Uh, what I would want to see is many more Jews uh, make Aliyah, come to Israel. This is the Jewish home. Uh, I'd want to see stronger uh, relationships between Israel and Jews across the world, uh, and Israel and its friends, its non-Jewish friends. I'd uh, want to see a very strong Israel, uh, ultimately, where our enemies would give up on trying to destroy us. I think at some point when they realize it's so futile, it's, it's not going anywhere and we're here to stay, they'll uh, uh, come to terms with Israel and then there can be peace. Well, I also understand that this Thursday is the Israel Prize Ceremony, correct? That's right. Right, and you're going to kind of emcee that, right? Yeah. So what can we expect to see? What's that going to be like? The Israel Prize is the highest prize in Israel sure. for achievement. Uh, this year we have people like uh, Natan Sharansky, uh, who was a prisoner of Zion. Uh, we have Miriam Peretz, uh, who's a great educator, but she lost her two of her boys mm. uh, in war. Uh, we have David Levy, who really brought this Sephardi uh, community up uh, into recognition and uh, dignity here in Israel. Um, we have David Grossman, a famous sure. uh, book writer. So you really have, you know, all colors, all shades. It's, uh, it's going to be very festive. Sure. I want to talk about education also. I mean, that's obviously something you're hugely passionate about and have a, a pretty big hand in. What kind of reforms do you have planned for the near future in the Israeli education? Um, our biggest uh, effort right now is in science, math, technology, and what's called STEM. Mm. Uh, and we are dramatically uh, um, ramping up the, the uh, strength of uh, students in the periphery, in the Galilee, in the Negev, uh, in remote areas, to have access to the best education possible. Uh, second thing that we need to be doing, and we're doing, is injecting some of the startup nation magic into the uh, education system, entrepreneurship, uh, innovation, uh, because ultimately we need to prepare our kids for a very different future than one we have right now. You know, it's funny because I, I went to public school in the United States, and one thing that's, I think, interesting for Americans to see there is that there isn't as much separation of church and state in Israel because right. here religious studies and Jewish studies sure. and Torah studies are fundamental. That's a core part of the education. I mean, for that reason, Israeli schools have faced some criticism in the past for blurring that line. Why, why doesn't Israel make that same distinction between church versus state in the same way that the United States does? Well, that's because uh, uniquely uh, Judaism is uh, both a, a, um, a nation mm. and a religion. Um, and, and therefore, you know, if you're Jewish, that's your religion, but it's also the nation you belong to. Um, my approach is uh, I don't want to uh, force religion on anyone. I do want every boy and girl in Israel to know their heritage, mm. to know uh, what the Bible is about, to know uh, what Sabbath is about. I, I don't want to coerce anyone into uh, uh, performing any mitzvahs or anything of that mm. sort. I don't believe in coercion of any form, but I do believe that that's so fundamental in our uh, history, in our heritage, in our destiny that every boy and girl needs to know that. You know, on one hand, certainly on a, on a political level, you could say that ties between Israel and the United States has certainly never been stronger, and given the latest U.S.-led strikes in Syria, perhaps never more important than it is today. At the same time, many feel that the relationship between American Jews and Israel has never been weaker. So my question is, what can or should Israel do to keep that strength? 
Um, I view this as one of the biggest challenges of our generation. How do we retain the deep bond and connection uh, between Jews and the diaspora and the Israelis? Mm. Um, we've always had this relationship for thousands of years between Jews in Israel and Jews outside of Israel. Um, but I think in this particular generation where the um, memory of the Shoah is not firsthand anymore and sort of the story of, of, of uh, the establishment of Israel is 70 years old mm. already, uh, we need to get the younger folks involved, excited about being connected to Israel. That's why we do birthright. That's why we do Massa. That's why we do stuff on campus. But uh, I think we need to do more. Okay, last question, because I, I know you have to get going. What would you say to young American Jews who do feel um, alienated when they see that Israel may not be doing what they believe upholds their own Jewish values? What do you say to that Jewish American who feels alienated from Israeli policies as a government? First of all, I'd say come and visit. Come see Israel. Don't believe what's on TV. Come and see it for yourself and you'll see a remarkable country. Not a perfect country. We're not perfect, but we try to be perfect. Um, and, and it's tough. We, we are located, we don't have Canada and Mexico as our neighbors. We have uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, Iran, Iranian uh, proxies, ISIS on our borders. So it's tough. Yet we remain a vibrant democracy. Um, and secondly, I, I just would want them to know that whatever happens, in any outcome, any event, uh, we're brothers. And there is a country here always waiting for any Jew. Um, you know, never again will a Jew be persecuted and not have somewhere to go to. Hmm. Well, on that note, I just want to thank you again so much. Thank you happy, so much. Happy Independence Day. You take care. Thanks, you too. Thanks, thanks so much. All right, now I'm excited to share our next piece. My first experience ever living in Israel was in a kibbutz, actually the one that you're about to see. A kibbutz is a special collective community that's unique only to Israel. Kibbutzim have actually been around since 1909 and are known for pioneering the state, but I don't want to give away too much. So here's the real breakdown of what it's like to live in a modern day socialist community. There are some who claim that a real utopia exists and it's located right here in Israel. It's called a kibbutz. This is Kibbutz Ramat Yochanan, one of 275 collective communities throughout Israel. In other words, members share ownership of everything. My house is his house, your car is my car, and your wife is my wife. They sustain a socialist lifestyle, which means that everybody makes the same amount of money no matter what they do for a living. But money is no object because these communities promise that you'll have everything that you could possibly desire. So how does it work? In Kibbutz Ramat Yochanan, we have about 480 members. We all make around uh, 5,000 shekels a month, whether we're doctors, farmers, teachers, whatever. Well, that and about another 1,000 for each kid a family may have. That may not sound like much, but almost everything you need is covered by the kibbutz. We don't pay rent for our houses. We don't pay any bills. We don't have municipality taxes. Anytime we have a problem with our house, any kind of repair we need, the kibbutz takes care of it. Our health care is completely covered by the kibbutz, including a dentist, and if needed, a psychologist. We don't need to pay for nursery or preschool because the kibbutz has it for free from uh, three months and up. We're now 10, 17. I'll get my own apartment, totally covered by the kibbutz. Cool, right? And if I want to go to college, my parents don't have to worry about it. I know what you're thinking. He's probably going to need a ride. That's not a problem. Here we have about 100 cars and we can take which car we want and we can drive wherever we want and we don't even have to pay for the gas. But what about food? We have a kibbutz dining hall that serves breakfast and lunch every day. And we even have dinners on Fridays. Plus the leftovers go to charities. It's like one big family meal all the time. For an average of three to six shekels a meal, the selection is pretty incredible. I mean, it's a buffet, so believe me, it tastes better than it looks. And don't forget, basically your entire backyard is a living, breathing feast. Want to go to the gym, the pool, play tennis, need a haircut or a facial? Want a daily professional laundry service? The Kibbutz has all of that, and it's all for free. If you're a member, of course. 
So how do I sign up? Not even the kids of members are actually true members until they decide. They have until the age of 30 to explore the outside world, and then if they want to come back, they have to be approved. But if you're an outsider, well, you better get married to one of those children. But even then, you'll still have to live on the kibbutz for at least a year before the kibbutz decides if they like you enough. And there are lots of kibbutzim like Ramat Yochanan that are valued at hundreds of millions of shekels. Now, if you're wondering why that matters, it's kind of like having a community that's willing to invest in your passion. For example, if you want to open your own business, the kibbutz will finance it as long as you can prove that it's ultimately going to be profitable. And not all kibbutz members have to work on the kibbutz. In fact, one of the kibbutz's biggest sources of income comes from the salaries of members who work as major executives outside. But don't get me wrong, kibbutzim like Ramat Yohanan have some extremely successful businesses themselves. In fact, kibbutzim as a whole account for 40% of Israel's agricultural output and 9% of the country's industrial turnout. Together, that's worth almost $10 billion. The question is, are you willing to give up your capitalist lifestyle for this type of utopia? Listen, we don't share a wife here, yeah? That was so you cannot cool. take... So, uh, no, you cannot cool. take my wife, his wife. It's not everything is everybody's. Almost everything. Okay, okay. Now, this is just a very brief and surface-level look into what a kibbutz is all about. We could literally make an entire episode about these communities, but one thing is for certain. If you do travel to Israel, go and check out a beautiful kibbutz like Ramat Yohanan. It certainly changed my life and future. 41 years ago, Israeli basketball champion Tal Brody helped make history by helping Maccabi Tel Aviv win the European Championship for the first time ever. At the time, he made headlines with his famous remark after winning, Israel's on the map and we're staying on the map. Well, today he's dedicating his life to making sure that that happens as the official goodwill ambassador of Israel. And he's joining us in the studio today for Israel's 70th birthday. Now, Tal, I didn't mention the long list of other accomplishments you have. You've received the Israel Prize. Uh, you've lit the torch on Independence Day, Lifetime Achievement Award in the Knesset. It, it goes on. You, you just got an honorary doctorate degree also from Bar Ilan University. So tell us what you do specifically as a goodwill ambassador. It's not only that Israel is on the map and we're staying on the map, but not only in sport, but in everything. Now, as a goodwill ambassador, basically, I've been going uh, throughout North America and Canada and meeting the students on the university and basically in speaking to African-American groups, Hispanic groups, African, uh, uh, all um, the denominations of the Christian groups and the Jewish groups. And basically on the campuses, our problem is that our Jewish kids are under Let's say they're the minority today. There's, a, of the last decade, the influx of Muslim students on the campuses with the guidance of the Muslim organizations. They have a majority on campus against the Jewish students, which I do have to stay, say that many more are standing up for Israel today. Many more are understanding Israel because of the birthright programs, the Young Judea programs, the JNF programs, and that's been a great help to well, us. Well, you know, you've also been traveling around the world beyond just going to campuses and dealing with lots of di different delegations. Have you seen any changes in how Israel is being perceived by the international community since you started back in 2008, 2010? Well, by publicly speaking, the diplomats, they don't really come out in positive statements to Israel because they see what their people see on the television. Unfortunately, the television looks at Israel only from the eyes of Hamas, Hezbollah, what's happening in Syria and Iran. But our life in Israel is completely different. I mean, if you look at the OECD, Israel, uh, the population of Israel has voted. We were about 11th in the world out of 190 some countries that the people in Israel uh, feel the, the happiest of living in yeah. Israel. Or it was the 10th or 11th country where it was voted, uh, where it's best to raise your children. So now, it, the life in Israel is good, Yeah, and, and basically. It's, well, I mean, here's my question for you. Today, what do you view to be one of the biggest challenges that Israel is facing? Well, as far as security, I've been here since the Six Days War. Uh, never felt unsecure, unsecure yeah. in the intifadas or in the basic wars in Lebanon. Uh, 
we feel secure. We, we're not, it's not 100% anything. Mm -hmm. And we have problems within normal society that has problems. But as far as Israel itself, I think that we've been progressing. We're the first that come when any type of uh, hurricanes or earthquakes in the world, our technology, our medicine. I mean, it's, the, the country has unbelievably progressed. Uh, we have now uh, the Iron Dome, which keeps us safe. Uh, nothing is 100% uh, foolproof, but uh, mm -hmm. I think that uh, in relation to what many people think of Israel, uh, our army will handle everything. But well, our problem is the public diplomacy, what yeah. they call Asbara. We have good people in all the consulates and all the embassies all over the world but uh, we're at a minority, as I'm glad that the Christian groups are coming up and helping the Jewish groups on campuses against these demonstrations, because definitely Israel's not an apartheid state, and we don't have walls. We have a security fence, and that security fence is like a Lego. There's going to be a peace agreement. If there's going to be a peace agreement in the future, it could be taken down as it was built, and Israel never built fences. The only fences that were built yeah. were from Jordan. Uh, 1948, when we were attacked for the first time out of five times that this country was attacked. And the UN was the one that, 242, that said that uh, new borders have to be decided between two parties. But we need the other party to come and sit down with us to make the decisions where it's going to be and what will be the future of uh, Palestinians and uh, the Israelis. Well, I think, you know, part of your work as Goodwill Ambassadors to kind of open up discussion for where Israel is headed and what the future is. And, and we really thank you for joining us today on Israel's 70th birthday celebration. I'm going to let you go now because I know you need to go and party like every other Israeli in the country. Thank you for joining us, Tal. Thank you. And now for our top five with ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh. So similar to 4th of July, Israelis love to party hard and celebrate their home country. And considering the Holy Land is turning 70 this year, you'll see more people than ever running around the streets repping the blue and white flag. So I'm here to give you guys the secret Tel Aviv inspired top five events list you just have to check out. Number one on the list is the annual Israeli Air Force Air Show. Every year the Air Force organizes a special air show and flyover which passes over much of the country. Featured in the show are a range of different aircrafts from the Israeli Air Force fleet including acrobatic planes. The flyover lasts around 45 minutes and is a beautiful start to the Independence Day weekend. Rabin Square is the second on our list. This can be considered the official city party and starting point to all Independence Day events. Starting at a quarter to nine outside the Tel Aviv Performing Arts Center, you can find family activities, performances by some of Israel's best artists and DJs, and most festive of all, fireworks. Doesn't get more Independence Day than that. Third up is the Palkai Alkon Music Festival. This event is considered to be the largest electronic music festival of its kind, with two major stages hosting international artists along with some local talents as well. This is an all-nighter party starting at 10 p.m. and lasts all the way till 8 in the morning, so get ready to party hard, Israel style. Fourth up is the Midburn Takeover. For those who don't know, Israel hosts an annual Midburn Festival, which is considered to be the Israeli version of the Nevada-based Burning Man. But this time, the Midburn community decided to take over the nightlife scene for Independence Day and host pre-Midburn parties all over the city. So if you want a little taste of what's to come for the actual festival, make sure to check out all their parties hosted in clubs like Beth Mariv and Drama for some pre-Midburn festivities. Last but certainly not least, like any typical Independence Day, street parties, barbecues, and rooftops are the main attraction for those who just want to hop around the city. If you're anything like me, you love roaming around the streets, taking in all the amazing energy and seeing everyone repping blue and white. So if you don't like committing and just want to experience Yom Ha'atzmaut in its purest form, street party slash rooftop, hop your way around. That's all for today's top five. Back to you. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight is expected to be clear and warm with a low of about 63 or 17 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow should be sunny and clear again, but with a slight drop in temperatures to a high of 78 or 26 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.52 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Natasha Kirchuk and thanks for watching. Happy Independence Day!